Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage podcast with Greg Gregory. Join us as Greg interviews powerful thought leaders and successful team and leadership experts from across the country on teamwork, leadership, and organizational culture. Now let's check in for this week's episode. Welcome to the Teamwork Advantage, a podcast dedicated to the advancement of teamwork, leadership, and culture in the workplace, in the organization of nonprofits, as well as your families. Teamwork is something that's very easy to do, sometimes can be a little arduous, yet it's something that is necessary in all walks of life, and today is going to be no exception. If you like our podcast, we invite you to make sure you subscribe and uh, share with everybody else the power of this message of free information on all three of these, what I call the TLC of business. Hi, I'm Greg Gregory, your host and founder of the Teamwork Advantage. Today, we're fortunate to be joined by Mark Briggs and is a management consultant helping Fortune 500 companies modernize, which is a great word to use today, their operations and culture, as well as their leadership by facilitating cutting edge transformations or sometimes called change management, I guess. As a speaker and trainer, as well as a consultant in digital transformation and innovation, Mark has worked with groups across the United States, Europe, China, Middle East over the past 15 years. He's the author of three books, one of which we're going to talk about today, The Butterfly Impact, as well as Change Management at the University, uh, Professor in Leadership and Change Management at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Mark Briggs, we'd like to welcome you to The Teamwork Advantage. Thanks, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here. We're going to have a little bit of fun today and kind of drive this out there a little bit and just learn a little bit because there's something that's fascinating um, about as I was reading over your bio and you're uh, calling in today, you're outside of Seattle, Washington. And so it's kind of interesting to get different aspects of different people from all over the world and what the challenges are and the different aspects of teamwork, leadership and culture, because we're all fueling the same concept. So I'm anxious to hear some things from you. Give us a little background on you. Um, how'd you get started? You uh, ended up, I know, went to college in uh, Spokane, Washington. So give us a little background, how you got into this, this ordeal of uh, tr- transformation. Well, it's a long and winding path. I started in college at Gonzaga University as a sports writer. I uh, wanted to just be a sports writer for newspapers. And I did that following graduation and uh I graduated in 1991, right into the teeth of a recession where jobs were really hard to come by. So I was waiting tables. I was remodeling houses. I was answering the phone on Friday and Saturday nights, at the newspaper outside of Seattle, just trying to get my foot in the door. I finally did get a full-time job as a sports writer for newspapers and quickly realized I didn't like that job. So <laughs> my career aspiration in about three years after college uh, was turned upside down. So I actually quit my job, moved across the country to the University of North Carolina, uh, where I was going to pursue a master's degree in journalism because I thought I wanted to teach in college at one point in my life. And while I was there, it was 1998, and I discovered the internet, uh, and it was taking off, and it was going to have a huge impact on journalism, on news, and just on the media industry, which is where I still wanted to work. So after I got my master's degree at UNC, I moved back to the uh, Seattle area, and I ran newspaper websites for about eight years, um, trying to help organizations, um, you know, take on the challenge of disruptive technology, trying to leverage the creativity of the teams and really push forward on innovation to to save what I think are, you know, obviously critically important pieces of of our culture and our society. Uh, Local news, you know, has had a tough go for the past 15 years and it's not getting any better. And so I I did that for for about eight years and then um, decided to quit and start my own uh, startup company with a, a couple of friends. We were doing software as a service and trying to, again, help local news publishers uh, with a tool that we thought would help them create community and bring in some revenue on their websites. Um, But again, you know, a recession was about around the corner in 2008. So we had a a short but good run uh, with that startup company. Uh, I learned a lot along the way and then uh, found a job with the NBC affiliate in Seattle at King 5, uh, where I became the director of digital media and innovation. 
So one of the things I like to say is if you're going to fail, you might as well fail forward. So I turned in my, my startup failure into a, a better job and spent seven years uh, with King5 and, and again, learned a great deal doing corporate innovation projects and um, being part of a big change management project there. And that's where I really, I think, fell in love with the idea of full organizational transformation. So in 2017, I left King to join Smith Geiger, which is a a storied uh, media consulting and audience research firm out of Los Angeles. And I've been working with them uh, ever since helping large market television stations across the United States reinvent and modernize their cultures, their processes, and the way they work and the content they create and the news they cover. So it's been a squiggly line, certainly not a straight line from there to here, but uh, you know, I've learned as much as I could along the way and just have always tried to figure out how can I help? How can I help um, the organization, the team, the mission, mm -hmm. and just learn as much as I can as I go along? You know, it's interesting. A couple of things you talked about there I thought fascinating was failing forward. Um, we had a uh, guest on the uh, podcast recently who talked about celebrating failures. And I think that's absolutely one of the greatest things you can do. And that helps you then move forward, if nothing else. So that may be kind of along the same lines. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I was also fascinated when you talked about changing the culture of major market television stations. Okay, as opposed at major market, let's let's define in the media world, major market are things like uh, DC, Baltimore, you know, those larger markets where you've got um, several million viewers. Is that about right? That's and correct. Got, My clients are in tier two markets, then you got your tier threes, and then yep. you got your really local stations. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's just a different challenge in New York and Los Angeles and Chicago and San Francisco than it is in Spokane or, you know, smaller towns. Right. So I found it interesting, though, about changing the culture. What was the culture like in these major markets compared to what I just was fascinated that it was you talked major markets there? Well, most of the clients that I end up working with, the ABC-owned station group, uh, mm -hmm. have been pretty dominant in their markets for a long time. And so um, there is a sense of pride and accomplishment and well-deserved. And so when you talk about trying to change the culture so that we can change the output and really connect with audiences on these emerging platforms, um, you're talking about taking apart a, a machine that's working really well for the one thing it was set up to do you know, mm -hmm. decades ago. So the, the challenge was how do we modernize our content for all these digital platforms, including social media, including mobile, including over the top television and connected TV apps like Roku and Apple TV. So there's definitely change needed. And so as I tried to help teams figure out how to do that content differently for those platforms, we started going up the line, really, if you think about an assembly line uh, concept here, the first original story idea flows through and becomes, you know, part of an assignment. And then you have reporters and photographers and you have producers. So there's people along the way as this assembly line, you know, takes hold. And I started working my way back up through the upstream and really ended up at the very beginning, which is the culture and the way that, uh, that the companies communicate, the teams mm -hmm. organize and, and prioritize, and really how the, the goals and the criteria, really we ended up establishing criteria for what was the kind of storytelling, what was the kind of news and information that needed to be created to be on brand and part of the mission as it extended beyond just linear television and into all of these other digital media platforms. You know, that's fascinating because you also talked there a couple of times about storytelling and it's more than just reporting. Right. It, it's about being able to tell a story in that. And that's something that marketing geniuses uh, have found for years, how to move a story in 30 seconds in a commercial right. that I have absolutely been mesmerized with over the years. So moving into that and dealing with change management made sense. You're also kind of a... I won't say, I won't go through necessarily say an expert, but you're, you've got a lot of focus on work-life balance. So where did that come in there? How did work-life come in with the butterfly impact and getting all of that together? It's interesting because the innovation and that appetite and that recognition for innovation that I had been applying to my work world for 
more than 10 years, you know, taking on the internet, trying to figure out how to leverage it to help organizations and help teams. But it was that spirit of innovation of how do we do things better that I started applying to my own life after I went through some pretty serious personal crises at home. I had not one, but two uh, sort of painful divorces and had some other sort of family um, challenges that I had to overcome. And in order to do that, I really needed to innovate my life. And that's where I started looking into how do I make, you know, the days and the hours that I'm living be more valuable? How do I spend more time on the things that I value? And then I started meeting with clients, obviously, as I was helping to, you know, bring this change management to these organizations. And there was certainly that challenge of, hey, we've always done things this way. And here's the new strategy. And, you know, here's how we're going to sort of re-engineer the way we do things. But then on the other side of it were people that we needed to execute those plans. And sometimes those people were just frankly burnt out and frankly dealing with too much outside of work to really be the player we needed them to be at work. So then I started thinking, well, I've got to figure out a way to help them outside of work as well. That started becoming a collection of ideas and research and other, you know, sort of areas of interest and action steps and experiments that was just rumbling around in my head with no real, you know, coalescing, you know, single point of focus until the pandemic hit. And then my clients started asking me to you know, help them communicate to their staffs. How do you deal with burnout? How do you deal with this overwhelm? And all of those, you know, disparate ideas started to come together. And I started writing these essays for corporate leadership. And eventually I realized this could be a, a book and this could really help some people. So that's how the butterfly impact came about. It's interesting. So there is the butterfly impact. Of course, I've always heard the butterfly effect for years or the pebble effect in the lake and things like that. You definitely bring a, uh, a clarification to the difference between the effect and the impact. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, the butterfly effect, I, as you say, has been around for a long time. It's part of chaos theory and probably mm-hmm. most famously mentioned in the movie Jurassic Park with Jeff Goldblum's character. And he said, you know, if a butterfly flap, flaps its wings, I think in Beijing, it could cause a thunderstorm in Central Park or something to that effect. And the idea really is about small changes can have, you know, outsized impacts downstream in a mm-hmm. connected system. The way I wanted to reframe that and look at it through a different lens is, is giving people the, the power and the confidence that they could actually make their own small changes that they don't actually know what they're going to lead to, but as they continue to make these small changes in their life, they will have a ripple effect to other people. And hopefully that ripple effect will continue. But the whole point of all of the recommendations that I make in the book are around do these small things just for yourself, but have the confidence that they could, you don't know how, but they could have a positive ripple effect on everybody around you. That's, that's fascinating to stop to think about that because in the last 18 to 20 months with the pandemic, the challenge has really become so many people are self-centered on them, their selves, their own business, their own personal growth, their own everything, that they're not looking at the impact that it may or may not have on other people. Am I along the right lines there? Yeah, absolutely. And I think for a lot of people who have been working from home and weren't working from home before, I've talked to lots of clients who have had to figure out how to create that separation. And even at the end of the day, maybe it's five or six o'clock and you turn off the laptop up in your office and you walk downstairs. If that last interaction you had at work, if that last situation was frustrating or stressful, Mm -hmm. you're now bringing that into your family. And now you're bringing stress into your family. You've created a different dynamic there. And then if that continues, then you're going to bring that back to work in the morning. Absolutely. For me, the butterfly impact is all about, I'm going to make sure that I can find little points in the day, make pull little levers is how I describe it, that make me healthier, make me more balanced and more grounded. So that when I go have that interaction at home after work, I'm the best partner, the best spouse, the best parent that I want to be then I'm going to have great interactions at home that night, that evening, and I'm going to wake up refreshed and I'm going to take a moment in the morning and I'm going to reset 
And then I'm going to hit my work day again with that positive energy. And I'm going to bring that positive energy to the people that then I interact with all day with the thinking that that ripple effect, you know, I could have this positive impact on you. And then the next person you talk to, you're going to bring that positive impact to them. Okay. So your book is called the butterfly impact. Am I, am I correct on the right title there? You are correct. So, and so that's available on Amazon wherever you can pick up your books. Correct. When, did, when was that released? About two weeks ago. Oh, so it's very new. It is very new. So yes. it, it was written and tweaked through the pandemic. Am I right? Yeah, it turned out to be the best pandemic project I could think about. <laughs> and it was a little bit of an un, unintentional positive outcome because when I, as I mentioned, I, you know, I had collected all this research around work-life balance and, and, uh, and other related topics. And I thought I was just going to write a book of curated research to other books, other studies, other podcasts, TED Talks, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And as I started the process, I um, decided to interview, you know, one person to sort of kick off the book because as a journalist and someone who's been around great storytellers my whole life, I know that a personal story is a better yep. way to connect with an audience. And that conversation went so well that then I thought, well, I should do that again. And it snowballed and I ended up interviewing more than a hundred people. Wow. And some people, you know, connected me with new people that I hadn't met. Some people I hadn't talked to in five years. Some people I'd only met once at a conference 10 years ago. And I just had always known that I wanted to talk to them again at some point in my life. So I looked them up on LinkedIn and I reached out and I said, hey, can I interview, interview you for my book? And because it was quarantine and nobody else had anything else going on, everybody was available. <laughs> So it was really yeah. the best year to think about, you know, obviously this is all in retrospect to, you know, figure out, hey, I'm going to go talk to a hundred people. Everybody was available. Nobody was traveling for work. Nobody had family stuff. And those conversations in quarantine were so energizing to me that, you know, as on a personal level, just doing the process of the book was actually really transformative just for me. So let me ask you the question. When you're thinking about this coming out in the pandemic, time and the research being a, for all intents and purposes in the pandemic time how do you think it has changed from how it might have been two three years ago it's got to have changed so much just because of the experience that people have had i mm -hmm. think this work-life balance you know i talk about in the book as it became for a lot of people work-life blending in a way that you just didn't have before for most people, at least the people that I was talking to, the idea of creating work-life harmony instead of just balance to where you could actually spread out your workday interwoven with your family life as needed. So it wasn't like a block of eight hours or 10 hours of work and then you do family. It might be two hours of work, two hours of family, two hours of work. You know what I mean? It was mm -hmm. just much more of a harmonious blending for people, or at least that's what they were trying to get to. And that just didn't exist. Also, just the uncertainty that people have been dealing with in terms of the economy, their jobs, their kids' school, masks, vaccines. I mean, that, you know, sort of layer of stress, that cloud of uncertainty over everything we're doing, colors all of our interactions with one another. It colors how much and, and it influences how much positivity we can bring to our interactions. And so I feel like a lot of people that have talked to me tell me about, you know, just these Zoom calls that are just nothing but work and that personal connection yeah. and that water cooler conversation that after the meeting ends, talking about the football game or talking about the Netflix series, just those kinds of positive reinforcements of humanity were gone. And that end up causes what I consider to be massive burnout. Absolutely. And do you think that that's leading to the term that's being coined right now called the great resignation? I think burnout is one part of it. I think the other part of it is people had a, a moment to have a bit of a reckoning during the pandemic. And as mm -hmm. they were home and as they were um, really, their lives were reduced just to their jobs. You know, if your kids soccer games and your work travel, and your you know, local tennis team, I mean, if all that went away, you had your family or your friends and your work. And it really got reduced to that. And I think it forced a lot of people to take a closer look at 
what was really important in their life and mm -hmm. maybe use this chance to have a reset and to think more clearly about prioritizing what really is valuable to you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why the subtitle of the book is Resilience, Resets and Ripples, because I think this is a moment of reset for a lot of people. And they are trying to figure out how do I make more time for the things I value as we go forward and, and we have this opportunity. So I, I think you see people saying, you know, I'm going to move to a small town. I want to, I want a quieter, slower lifestyle. And if their employer says, sorry, we need you in the office, they are saying, okay, well, I'm going to go get later. another job then. Yep. And so it's that empowerment of the employee that is, I think, causing the great resignation. Part of it is, yeah, burnout, like you say, but I think a bigger part of it is this moment of reset that we find ourselves in. There's been a lot of organization, I guess, companies, uh, a lot of startups during the pandemic too. Uh, a lot of pivots uh, yeah. for people. I mean, this podcast is an example of that. Uh, I had never had the time to develop a podcast before. And then all of a sudden during the pandemic, we just set it up. And as you said, it was getting guests. It was yeah, Everybody's like, hey, give me something to do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to get interviewed. It sounds like fun. Yeah, exactly. And so it's trying to learn how to do all that. So I've had to learn how to do it. And it's been an absolute blast on my end. And then it helps, you know, people like yourselves get your message out there. So the question now goes, what, what are you seeing with your clients about the work-life balance? And what are you recommending to them? What's working? And I guess also what's not working? Or did they overdo something like the happy hour Friday Zoom meeting? You know, things like that. I, I've heard that is like way overdone now. I think it certainly ran its course. I don't know a lot of people that are still doing that necessarily. Um, but I do think that what I've seen be really successful with my clients, with people that I'm working with, is taking control of your of your schedule and having the discipline to carve out time in the morning, uh, at lunch, uh, in, at the end of the day, and really create those boundaries. And I was talking to a team from Amazon on Friday and trying to help them get started. Um, they were very much uh, self-admittedly very poor at this work-life balance challenge. Uh, and the culture of Amazon is certainly, uh, you know, a difficult one for that, I think. But just trying to give them a sense of, you know, wake up 15 minutes earlier tomorrow or Monday or whenever it happens to be and take that time to write in a journal or just read a book or just you know, do nothing. Uh, but you need that moment of time to hit control alt delete on your own operating system and to really reset. And it's like having too many browser tabs open in your window and your computer starts slowing down. Unless you do that, you're not going to get that reset. And then, yeah. you know, 15 minutes for lunch, you know, put it on your calendar. If you have to go out four or five or six weeks on your calendar to find that white space, put it in there. And, you know, and honor it because, you know, what happens is that what that 12 o'clock meeting you get invited to, uh, you can say, let's just do that at one o'clock. You can do that if you go out far enough with your calendar. Exactly. And same with the end of the day. So one of the things that and this is something I learned from someone I interviewed with my book was at five o'clock, you know, close it down, do something else. So what I do at five o'clock because I don't have Zoom calls anymore is. I just close the laptop. I usually throw in a podcast in my AirPods and walk around the neighborhood, get a little fresh air. Mm -hmm. I might come back and do some more work later, but mm -hmm. it's having that absolute stop to the end of the day, which then allows you to look differently at what you were going to do. So when I come back, maybe I eat dinner, then I look at some emails and I say, does any of this need to get done right now? And it feels differently when you're looking at that after you've had a break and a separation yeah. from it, than if you just keep going. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's nine o'clock and you haven't eaten dinner or talked to your children. I know somebody refers to that as the Fred Flintstone effect, uh, <laughs> shutting down at five o'clock and just going. Um, I like the concept though, that you're okay with going back to the office or going back to your emails at certain points, just to check to yeah. see if there's anything that needs to be done. Um, it's that harmony, right? Where you can yeah. have it interwoven into your life instead of it being, I mean, and this is for people obviously who are working remotely and maybe don't have that commute. I know a lot of people I've talked to, 
claim to actually surprisingly miss their commute because it offered that bookend to the day. And it was that separation between the Mm -hmm. office and before you got home to the family and you had that, that time and people need to artificially build that in if you're working from home now, because you need that, that opportunity to reset. Yeah. And um, that's why the podcast link that I focused in on when we developed this, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought this might last, you know, two or three months. Uh, and so I developed it saying, okay, the av- I researched the average commute in the United States was about 40 minutes. Uh, you know, in some places a lot more, some places less, but you know, whether it's on subway in New York city or whether it's, you know, doing a drive in LA traffic, you know, one way or the other, it was about 40 minutes. Wow. And so, um, you know, when the pandemics hit, I, it's also right now, believe it or not, about the average dog walk length in the morning. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is a much better use of time. Oh, it's, it's, it's my therapy time. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's finding that. So one of the things let's kind of, t- I want to tie this in a little bit with the work line is getting things accomplished at work. You mentioned the water cooler breaks. And there's no doubt that that's, that's probably one of the number one conversations that people are missing is the water cooler, the elevator, the passing in the hallway, the walking down to get the bagel or whatever. Those little 30 second to five, seven minute conversations. What are you recommending to clients to kind of regenerate that? We've been talking to several different guests on here about things. I want to get your take on what are you recommending to people to regenerate that type of a talk uh, to make sure the, the work balance is still there and not just staring at a screen? There's a couple simple things that organizations can do. One of them is to try to be better about 45 or 25 minute meetings instead of always just arbitrarily scheduling an hour or 30 and you can use that extra 15 minutes at the end of an hour to have that sort of downtime discussion or that informal discussion for folks who want to hang around and, and mm-hmm. have that. You can also, you know, institute some arbitrary and sort of forced opportunities for positive feedback, which I've seen recently be very powerful. So thankful Thursday, for example, I was on a call about a month ago and the person leading the call, it was a Thursday and said, we're going to do thankful Thursday and we're going to go around the Zoom call, and everybody's going to say what they're thankful for. There's another exercise I write in the book called the appreciation hot seat. And so if you have a weekly meeting, you pick one person every week and they're on the hot seat and everyone else on the call offers their appreciation for what they like about working with that person. And we did that on a call last week that I was leading. And it was just really cool to see people I mean, a couple of people were actually in tears when they were hearing these positive words had their way. And it just, you could tell it had been so long since anyone had said anything nice to them that this felt so foreign and so shocking to them that they were overcome with emotion. And I think that to me just told said, we just aren't doing this enough. We're just not connecting as human beings enough yeah. in this Zoom world. And we need to actually force it to happen because it's not happening, you know. You know, just it's always been important. And I think so many of us took those little three minute conversations for granted, right? That it's really caused a problem today. Um, have you had any pushback on people saying, oh, that's just a bunch of foo foo crap. We don't need that. I don't know that people push back directly, but they certainly um, will opt out or maybe just not opt into some of these conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, And some of the clients that I work with, we've set up some of these sessions to focus specifically on sharing ideas around creating more work-life balance. And frankly, the turnout isn't great from a bunch of people who said they wanted it. So it's one of those, you know, interesting situations where people are too busy to have a conversation about work-life balance. (laughs) And yet that's what they're complaining about. So, okay. you know, those, those are difficult situations to try to navigate where people feel like they're too busy to take the time. But to be honest, that's, that's what it is. You have to be able to commit to yourself and be disciplined yeah. about taking care of yourself so that you can be there for everyone else, whether it's your teammates at work or your 
um, your kids at home, your spouse, your partner, whoever it is that you yeah. need to show up for. Yeah. You know, that goes back a lot to a, a book from the 1980s called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Dr. Stephen Covey in Habit 7, of course, was called Sharpen the Saw. I wrote about it. we got to be book. able to sharpen our own saws. That's exactly right. I also talk about from that book, The Big Rocks in the Jar, which yes. is to say you got to put the big rocks of your life in the jar first, first before you fill it up with all the sand and gravel yep. and trying to I help people understand what the sand and gravel looks like compared to the big rocks. Mm -hmm. You know, the big rocks of your life are the things that are really valuable and the most important to you. And the reason that you're living this life and they'd better be in your jar on your calendar every week. And that's one of the things that I've worked with clients on is to say, what are the things that you really personally value? And look at your work calendar. Look at your life calendar. Are, are they on there? Are you spending mm -hmm. any time doing the things you say you value? If you're not, then you have to redo the way you're uh, allocating your time. And it takes some effort and discipline yeah. to do that. You know, it's funny you bring that up because I have used the analogy of the big rocks 15, 20 years. And personally, I had totally forgotten about it. <laughs> I had totally forgotten about it until you just brought it up. Well, one of the, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just one of the best things in the world to really yeah. get a handle on, especially in this pandemic world. Yeah. And this predating the pandemic, this, you know, hit me when a few years ago, uh, you know, I'm living in the Pacific Northwest where we value the REI lifestyle of mountain biking and skiing and hiking and backpacking and, um, you know, over the years, I've done a fair amount of that, but I, I looked at my year, you know, at the end of a year one time, and I was like, how many of those opportunities did I take last year? And there weren't very many. And so I said, wait, if this is really what I value, if these are my big rocks, I've yeah. got to figure out how to get them in the jar first. Yeah. And then I'll figure out how everything else falls around them. Because it turns out everything does fall around them once you get them in there first. Once you get them in there. Absolutely. And it's it's what I refer to a lot of times as uh, daily therapy. You know, when you're doing something that is meaningful and gives you meaning of something you love. For me, it's getting out on the Chesapeake Bay. For you, it's going REI uh, through the mountains and hiking and biking and all that. It's, it's whatever is your therapy is the PowerPoint there. Absolutely. So. I just spent uh, three amazing days at water ski camp in North Carolina <laughs> at the beginning of October. Uh, it's a place that we discovered two years ago, my water ski partner and I, and it, the people there are unbelievable. They're so supportive. They are, I mean, and it just is this, um, it's a rejuvenation of spirit as well mm -hmm. as anything else. And a woman who... Uh, she had never water skied before. Uh, she came with her husband. She's a young doctor. They're both young doctors in their thirties, probably. And, you know, she got up on two skis on the first day and then she dropped one on the second day. And that night around the campfire, we were saying, we were asking, are you going to try to get up on one ski tomorrow? Which is a very difficult thing to do. I have never and, been able to. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yeah, I'm going to try tomorrow. And she goes, and actually I've six years ago, I was in a wheelchair. She had this unbelievable sensory disorder with her nerves that she couldn't wear socks and she was doing her her internship um, with pediatrics in a wheelchair and her husband was working 120 hours and taking care of her and I'm standing next to him shooting video of her get up on one ski the next day was amazing and it was just this life affirming moment and this opportunity to you know have those opportunities with people that you know, you have to make those big rocks in your jar first. Okay. So I think that's going to be a great segue to where I want to go with the next question. Um, you focus in on transformation and change management a lot. You've got a, you got a thought process that talks about change the way we change. Change management, I get. But what do you mean by change the way we change? That really just comes back to the way people look at change and the way people either embrace it or resist it. Obviously, there's been so much written on this topic, starting with Carol Dweck and the growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. But it really does start there. I think mm -hmm. to me, changing the way you change is first believing in that change has the positive impact uh, or positive potential to impact your life. 
But even before that, it becomes, you have to just embrace the fact that there is going to be change. So one of my favorite sayings, and I really struggled to figure out who originally said this, it got credited to Benjamin Franklin, but um, change is inevitable and progress is optional. Mm -hmm. And it really comes down to understanding that change is going to happen to you and it's what you do with it that makes a difference. Yeah, it was what I'd always uh, listened to when a company came down. They said, these are going to be the changes that we're going to be implementing. You can either get on board the train or wave a goodbye. Uh, exactly. You know, exactly. It's, it's one of those things that we can either get, get with it. So what would you say is, is some things that an individual can do right now if they need to change the if they realize that they don't like change and there's a lot of people who don't like change they'd rather mm -mm, let's keep it the way it is what's something you'd recommend one or two ideas that they could do to start implementing a better change the best way to embrace change or at least accept the idea of change that i've seen work with my clients and in my own life is treating change as an experiment and running experiments in your life and trying things out and making things temporary. So it doesn't feel like you're making a forever change. You're making a temporary change. You might try something for one day. That's mm -hmm. an experiment and that's easy. That's a low bar that anyone should be able to clear. And so if you frame potential changes as experiments that you're gonna learn from and they mm -hmm. may not work and you may not like them, but you're gonna learn that you don't like them, whatever that happens to be, a new habit. Kind of like a kid a eating routine. vegetables. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it really is turning into, you know, turning change into experimentation, which is just about learning and play. And so one of the books that I write about is called Prime to Perform by Lindsay McGregor and Neil Doshi. I'm sorry, say and the title again. Prime to Perform. Primed. And primed, yeah. They did a ton of research on highly adaptive and, and high-performing cultures. And what they found was the high-performing cultures were a most adaptive, of course, because they were able to, to not only see the change, but embrace the change and take advantage of the change. But they also approached uh, work as an experiment and play. And so if you think about it, um, like I, I wrote about in the book, if you go to a children's museum and watch a five-year-old kid at the water table splashing around and seeing if something will float this way or that way, what they're doing is experimenting and they're learning and okay. they're trying something new. And what we call that is play, but we don't have a word for that in the professional world. Because when you graduate from high school, all of a sudden play just becomes something that you do for fun. But it really is about experimentation and learning at work, the same way that a five-year-old would perform at a children's museum, that's what we want people to see instead of it being change. We want them to see experimentation, learning, and play. Yeah, and it, you're right. Sometimes it will work and you'll be wow, and you'll be yeah. excited about it. And other times it's not, but it's not the end of the world. Right. You know, set the bar low to try something. If it doesn't work, so be it. You know, it doesn't work. Thomas Edison, was amazing at that. You know, he says, how many times have you going to fail at this? He says, I've never failed at inventing the light bulb. I just found other ways it didn't work. Exactly. You know, exactly. and that's, that's such a, a great part. So we talked about play. So let's, let's kind of bring this into it a little bit. In my workshops, a lot of times I will ask somebody, um, you know, about their team and, and things like that. And was there a time that the team just really clicked? And then I say, how much level, what was the level of work like? They say, oh, it's off the charts. I said, what was the level of stress like? Off the charts. Then I said, how much fun did you have? And they go, oh my God, we had so much fun. Why is it important for us as humans to have fun? I mean, we know that, you know, you'll never work another day in your life when you love what you do. But why is it important for us to literally have fun and laugh at work? Well, the science around laughing at work, for example, shows that it, increases creativity and reduces stress. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody, no matter what your role is or what your organization is, is going to need more creativity and less stress in order to succeed right. and in order to have fun. So, you know, I just did a workshop last month about incorporating humor into the workplace, into the routines of our daily work, simply be for those two reasons, because you need to increase creativity and decrease stress. Mm -hmm. I think that this notion of experimentation and trying things 
it is fun and it leads to play because you don't know and there's no real cost. Like you say, if you fail, you learn, you move on, but just trying new things can be fun. And that's the key. And when you do it with other people and you get that collaborative, that close collaborative juices going one idea on top of another idea on top of another idea. I mean, that's fun for people. It's that creative um, gelling together of the group and of the team in order to learn something and try something that you never considered before. And when it works, of course, it's even more fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we just lost one of the greats when it talks about humor in the workplace in Jeannie Robertson uh, about a couple of months ago. And she was just amazing at making us laugh and laugh at simple things in the workplace. You know, when we start to do that, and then we start to laugh and make fun of each other in a jovial way, not in a, a negative way, then we start to really build that and we start to feel like we're part of something. And um, several times you, you'll hear great teams say, you know, I feel like it's, it's we're a family. Right. And that starts is when, when the gel starts to happen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I've laugh. seen it happen in the pandemic less, but I'm seeing it, I'm seeing people in the last couple of months, you know, and this is October of 2021, they're realizing that it's not going to come back naturally. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to force it. And yeah. at, at one time in the beginning, it always feels strange to be forcing humor into the workplace, into Zoom calls. And it feels like there's too much to do. We're already overwhelmed. Now we're going to take time to have fun. And this is ridiculous. And then when you get people to do it, they, you, their shoulders drop the smile yep. happens yep, and you can see that they're going to have a better day today because you stopped and you took five minutes and showed a funny video and made them laugh. Well, and the interesting part is there's so much science behind the fact that when you're laughing and having a little bit of fun, <laughs> right. obviously the stress decreases, your work productivity actually will go up. Exactly. You know, because you, you think about the word recreation, it comes from the word recreate. And so when we take time to do that, hit the reset button and start to laugh a little bit, stress goes away. And next thing you know, we're more productive. Yep, exactly. And then you're a better mother, father, sister, brother, aunt, uncle, child, everything else starts to come into play. That's exactly it. I have a whole chapter in the book on that. Uh, well, let's, let's go ahead and talk about your book. It's called The Butterfly Impact. Yep. Is that the one we're talking about here now? That is the one we're talking about. Okay. So The Butterfly Impact, you've got a couple of other books. You want to tell everybody about your other books? Well, I, my other books really were journalism textbooks. Uh, and the la I've written four editions of a book called Journalism Next, which is really used in colleges across the country um, in, in their journalism programs. I also wrote a book called Entrepreneurial Journalism about 10 years ago uh, that I still use in my course that I teach for the University of North Carolina. Um, it's a master's course uh, for mid-career professionals and trying to figure out how to do pretty much everything we just talked about on this podcast uh, in their current job. Um, it's about change. It's about innovation. It's about experimentation and leadership more than anything in their organizations. Okay. Um, and so there's a bit of a through line here because while it doesn't maybe seem obvious that journalism textbooks and entrepreneurial journalism would lead to a book about work-life balance, it all goes back to innovation, like I was saying earlier. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, when I first started writing journalism textbooks, it was about helping people learn to be innovative as they tried to navigate the technological disruption mm -hmm. that digital media was bringing to journalism. And now I'm trying to help people innovate their lives to deal with what the pandemic has brought them and what yeah. the current work life stress is bringing them. So there, to me anyway, is a consistency. There's a nice the consistency and correlation. Yeah. I've also realized that a lot of times it's very hard for an individual to be innovative. They usually have to bring someone else or something else into it to stimulate their innovation. You know, I mean, Henry Ford did not develop the automobile. He just he had an idea, but it took a team to come together to make that whole idea go into play. And that's what creates the innovation. So I know that Wilma Rudolph even said, Whatever you did in life, someone else helps you. So the more we bring into our lives, the more we ask for help, the more we share the help, the more we work with other people, it all comes back to working with people. Absolutely. And the self-help is selfish is, is a concept that I talk about in the book. 
And it is, except that it's needed. And it is necessary for you to, as I say in the book, put on your own oxygen mask first before you help the person next to you. But at the same time, this innovation with your own personal life can be shared collaboratively. And so I've been leading some sessions with my clients where people are sharing their ideas of how they're trying to get more work-life balance and they're supporting one another in their experiments. And this, you know, sort of, I think collaboration around how people are managing their own lives and balancing work and life and trying to find that work-life harmony, that support that each other is getting is really powerful and really important because I completely agree with you that innovation needs to have support and collaboration. I think Eleanor Roosevelt's quote was, uh, you can't brighten the path of another without brightening the path of your own. Correct. And we've got to think about that. We've got to take care of ourselves. We can't take care of anyone else unless we're taking care of ourselves first. Absolutely. So powerful. Mark Briggs, it's been a privilege to have you on board with us today. Time has absolutely flown by and it's definitely been a different look at work-life balance than I've ever taken before. And I want to thank you for your time today. Um, Anybody wants to reach you? How can they reach you? Uh, So the, it's butterfly-impact.com is my website. And mm-hmm. then, of course, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram, just under my name, Mark Briggs. All right. Well, Brett, glad to have you on board here again today. Thank you for your time. Uh, butterfly-impact.com is how you can find the book. Uh, obviously, it's available on Amazon as well as other places to pick up. Uh, I want to thank you again. And you know, folks, once a week with the Teamwork Advantage, We share skills and ideas that you can actually use immediately. And we've definitely learned some of those here today. Until next week, remember, having a good day is just being average. When you listen to the Teamwork Advantage, we know you're not average. So go make today excellent and exceptional. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Teamwork Advantage with Greg Gregory. Be sure to like, subscribe, and activate the bell icon to be notified of future episodes. To learn more about how Greg can help your organization develop a powerful winning culture, visit TeamsRock.com. That's TeamsRock.com.